Hello and welcome everyone to the first event of 2022 for the Quimper Geological Society. My name is Rebecca Koronowski and I will be here to help uh, set the scene for us today. Um, I'll let Michael share a little bit more about the video we just saw in a moment here. Um, but before we get going, I just wanna let everyone know a couple of uh, tech tips. Um, so first up, you'll notice that we have uh, the audience with their mics muted for the duration of this session. And that's just to make sure we prioritize uh, the speakers who are on with us today. Um, but you are in the bottom left hand corner of your screen, um, encouraged to turn on your video so folks can see who's uh, in the room with us today. And uh, if you're you're here, thanks for coming. It's so great to have all of you joining. Um, we really appreciate the support that we've been getting on these Zoom events. Um, additionally, in the upper right hand corner of your screen, if you are on a computer or if you swipe left or right, if you're on a tablet, you'll be able to adjust the view settings that you have. Um, there may be a icon in the upper right that says view, or it may say gallery or speaker, depending on which version of Zoom you have available. So feel free to swipe around and uh, get the screen set up the way that works for you. Um, we will be taking questions in the chat. So I just sent a message to everyone. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, um, please feel free to send those there. And Michael and I will uh, curate a little Q&A um, at the top of the next hour uh, for Carolyn. Um, so send those along. And if there's some clarifying question that comes through that would be for the good of the order, we may uh, pop in and just, and just get that clarification as we go through. Um, we will be recording this session, um, speaker view only. So if your video is on, don't feel um, concerned that you will be on recording. It'll just be the folks who are talking on screen here. And we will send out a uh, announcement about the recording availability after the session. Um, and you can always go to quimpergeology.org to sign up to make sure that you are on the mailing list to receive those announcements and also to find links to any of the previous Zoom recordings that we have um, since mid 2020. So we've been doing this a while. So there's a lot of good content on there. So I encourage you to go and check them out. Um, we do have closed captioning available. If that is of interest to anyone, please shoot a message or shoot me a message or um, use the enable transcription request button um, to have those transcriptions turned on for you. Um, as I said, we will have, okay, someone requested, thank you. Um, and so if you are now seeing transcription on your screen, um, in the bottom uh, menu there, you may have to click the button that has that three dots and says more in order to get to the menu for live transcription. And if you would prefer not to see the transcription, you can choose hide subtitle. This is also where you can choose show subtitle if you'd like to see those. And if you're on a tablet or other device, that you need to tap on, you'll likely have to use the three dots more button and then find live transcript in that menu and uh, either turn on or off depending on your preferences. Um, thank you. We, as I said, we will get going here and we will end the presentation at about five o'clock and then we very much encourage folks to stick around for a Q&A round. Um, and so before I pass it on over to Michael, I just want to, um, as we do each time now, launch our getting to know you polls. And so some of you may be familiar with these questions. We have two of them 
where are you from, and what is your geologic background? So tap the answer to each question, and then you may have to click Submit to make sure that it gets to us. And I can see we are already getting a number of responses. This is really helpful information for us in a number of ways. Number one, it helps our presenters as they are uh, gearing up for their talk to know who's in the crowd so they can give, um, give their talk a bit more tailored to our specific audience. And then we have been tracking these statistics over time, um, which just helps us to see how our audience is growing and changing as we progress through these sessions. So again, click or tap on your answers and click submit. I think this may be the highest participation we've had on these polls. We have 90%, um, which is incredible. So if you missed it to uh, submit your answer, do feel free to share in the chat. Uh, someone did just share that they are an amateur geologist, which I, I love that phrasing. Um, so sharing the results here, interesting that there are a number of folks from Washington outside of Jefferson County this time around. So um, drop in the chat where in Washington you're tuning in from. Um, we'll be curious to know. No international folks today. Womp womp, maybe they'll watch our recording. And then again, a number of folks here with not a lot of geologic background. So um, thank you again for joining us. I studied geology in undergrad, and so I get to kind of consider myself a geologist like the rest of these folks. Um, and I really enjoy following along um, with these presentations. Oh, thanks everybody for sharing in the chat there. Lots of great locales in Washington and Colorado. All right, Micah, I think I'll pass it on over to you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Michael Machette here, Quimper Geological Society. Thanks for coming today. Missing all that sunshine outside, I know. Anyway. Uh, just one uh, news note, next month, February 19th, a Saturday, 4 o'clock, Marley Miller, professor of geology at University of Oregon, Corvallis, will talk about her book with Daryl Cowan called The Roadside Geology of Washington. So it should be interesting. This is the book to have in your glove box when you take that trip to Walla Walla or up to BC, and you can get it on Amazon, obviously. So that'll be on February 19th. So today we have Carolyn Drigger. And Carolyn is a hydrologist and outreach coordinator at the uh, U.S. Geological Survey in Vancouver, Washington. She's worked closely with several of our previous speakers from the Cascades Volcano Observatory. And we know uh, half a dozen people together, Carolyn and I, although we just met today. Her science career began, began about four decades ago with research on glaciers and glacier-related hazards, principally in the Cascade Range volcanoes of Washington and Oregon, and at the Columbia Glacier in Alaska. Carolyn witnessed the, night, the May 18, 1980 catastrophic eruption of Mount St. Helens and participated in the initial news response, media, media response. For her, this event set the course for several fascinating projects that crossed science disciplines and provided a front row seat for observing and reflecting upon the role of scientists in society. Now as the CBO's outreach coordinator, she works in partnership with public officials mercy planners, media, park interpreters, and educators to advance the cause of volcano hazards awareness. awareness. Before her USGS career, she spent several years teaching in a US-based US uh, public school and a private school in Kathmandu, Nepal, as well as working for the National Park Service. In her off time, off time which I don't think she has much of, Carolyn likes to spend her out time outdoors with activities that vary by the season including gardening, hiking, kayaking, and cross-country skiing. She sounds just like us. So without further ado, would you welcome Carolyn Drager? Her talk today is entitled Hazards of the Nevado del Ruiz and Mount Rainier Volcanoes, Leveraging Lessons We've Learned from, to Prevent Future Disasters. Carolyn, you've got the stage. 
Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for having me. And I think we'll start by uh, just sharing this, doing a sh screen share here, get the program started. Okay. Okay, can you see that all right? Looks great, Carolyn. Okay, let's go then. So hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be meeting with you today. It's a real honor to be here with speaking to geologists, uh, old and new um, uh, people with a lot of interest, whether you have it, geology as a avocation or a vocation. So it's, uh, it's really great to be here. So um, I'm from the, the other Vancouver, the, probably the one that's further from where you live. I lived in Vancouver, Washington. It's one that has that little fort, you know, with the picket stakes. Uh, it's not the big, shining, gleaming city up in British Columbia. So I work at the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory. We're part of the USGS. Um, there's one, one small piece of it. There are probably nine, 10,000 staff members, full-time staff members at the USGS. But I have to say that there have probably been thousands or maybe tens of thousands of people who have worked for the USGS, either part-time, uh, as field assistants and uh, interns, and maybe some of you have been, in fact, I'm pretty sure some of you have experienced work with it, the USGS um, in that capacity. So thank you for, to Michael Machette for uh, setting this up today. I wanna to thank Rebecca also for keeping things moving along. It seems like a good time also uh, to talk about some people, to mention some names of people who have done a lot of the research work. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the not necessarily research results per se, but we're going to be talking about what other people have done with those research results to improve risk reduction at two volcanoes. And but there are many, many people who have done a lot of work, and I just want to acknowledge uh, some of those who have worked at Mount Rainier, uh, including you know Rocky Crandall and Don Mulano. Some of you actually know them, maybe uh, in, at a time sometime in your life. Uh, Fisk, Hobson, and Waters, who wrote a, a major paper about the geology of the Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, um, Rick Hoblet, Kevin Scott, Dro Jack Dragovich, Patrick Pringle, Jim Valance, Willie Scott, Tom Sisson, and others. They've all brought the message forward. Uh, there are, in addition, geologists at other universities. Um, and so glad that we have the opportunity to work with you as well. In Colombia, we have geologist Marta, seismologist uh, Marta Calvache uh, from the, uh, the SGC, the uh, Servicio Eloico Colombiano. And uh, she's done a lot of risk re reduction work there as well as her colleague, uh, Gloria Patricio Cortez. And at the USGS, um, part of the uh, Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, the International Program for Volcano Risk Reduction, uh, I want to thank John Ewart, who was the instigator of a Columbia USGS uh, USA binational exchange that you'll be hearing about today. Okay, so I chose glaciers. Uh, uh, I thought they would be a very interesting thing to study in my career. Uh, it turns out that I thought they'd be maybe one of the most interesting and one of the most uh, dynamic processes that I would ever study. And that was until May 18th, 1980, when witnessing the eruption of Mount St. Helens. And even though I didn't realize it at first, it became very evident later that it had had a major bearing on, on my life and my career. So when I arrived at CBO, and after several years of finishing a, a debris flow project with Joe Walter at Mount Rainier, the glacial generated debris flows, you know, I was approached to start an outreach program regarding Mount Rainier. And that had several origins that I can tell you about but uh, you'll, you'll hear about it through the course of this. But I'd like to, for us to talk about volcanoes uh, in general and what they have meant to humans all along. And I think we have to realize that, that all through human time, erupt, volcanic eruptions have been a really big deal in people's lives, you know, a big deal for the local culture and memories have been made and oral traditions passed and written histories have been passed down through the generations. Experiencing a volcanic eruption is pretty much a full sensory overload. You know, you're, you see it, you hear it, you smell it, you feel it. It can be symbolic and because it's powerful and it's uncontrollable. And sometimes there is this idea that somebody did something wrong that the eruption happened in the first place. 
Uh, it's my contention that the same visceral reaction is ex that it was experienced by early humans is experienced by 21st century humans today. The, the same approach avoidance attitude remains. We see that by people trying to be safe and yet have we, we see thousands of people driving up to Johnson Ridge to view uh, a potential eruption there in 2005. But this response is really visceral and, and deep inside people. It's, uh, I want to bring to your attention some of the some events that happened that influenced what we our work at Mount Rainier. Uh, the uh, the events that I, I guess every generation or every group of people might choose something slightly different to, in terms of identification of of events volcanic events that have influenced them. But I'll bring up a few I think that are influential for people in in my generation and. Part of that was, I guess, with Mount Rainier, we could go back to Crandall and Waldron's paper from 1956 about the Rainier Lahars. But I put here to keep it simple, uh, you know, 1971 with uh, his Crandall's paper uh, concern, that lays out the, the Lahar, Lahar history at Mount Rainier. In 1975, a lot of people may forget that we had an increase in geothermal steaming there, which led to the melting of snow and ice at Mount Baker, and there was a fear that we might have a lahar move down the side of the volcano. I uh, thought that maybe a landslide would move into Baker Lake and displace the water over top the dam and cause big problems. So we learned a lot there about how to deal with people, how to deal with public officials. We rec it was the first time that had happened in, uh, for a volcano in the, in the uh, for explosive, potential explosively erupting volcano uh, in the contiguous states. And it was the first time that people had come together from HBO, Hawaii Volcano Observatory, uh, from many different locations because people had a, an a expertise that they could give to the situation. We were really, you know, a bunch of people, an ad hoc group of people that came, who came together uh, to um, address potential volcanic activity. And I want to note also that Jeff Renner told the uh, former King Five um, reporter, uh, told me that it was his conversations with David Johnston on the slopes of Mount Baker in 1975 that led him to dig into the literature and learn more about volcanic eruptions. And so when Mount St. Helens uh, reawakened in 1980, he sought out David Johnston, they already had a, a trusting relationship built that they could talk about potential for hazards. Okay, then we can we can move on to 1976 with La Sufrera Guadalupe in, uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, in 1979, we had an eruption at, at St. Vincent and both of these events were communication, were, were remarkable for the communication snafus that happened with the first one being completely uncontrolled whereby the fighting between scientists became the major world story rather than what might happen at the volcano. In 1979 at St. Vincent, the only the governor spoke for the scientists. Nobody was allowed to talk with them. One reporter who said he wanted to talk with the scientists uh, and threatened uh, to file suit with censor, because of censorship was uh, quickly deported. Uh, so we learned a lot there. We didn't really know what the best communication means was, but we, we saw that there were some examples to not follow. In 1980 at Mount St. Helens, of course, we learned about ash falls and Lahars debris avalanches and directed blast. And at that time, when we, we picked up the news communication scene, uh, Rocky Crandall and Don, and uh, Dan Miller would say, uh, you know, Dick Fisk is going to write up his ideas of how we ought to communicate. We just have to do our best here, but he is going to write up what he learned uh, being part of responses in the Caribbean. El Chichon volcano, we had 2000 fatalities from pyroclastic density currents, these, these sweeping hot avalanches of rock and gas that flow down valley. Nevada del Ruiz volcano in 1985 in Colombia, we learned about lahars. Of course, you're going to hear a lot about that today. And of course, Mount Unzen in 1991, um, dome collapse, uh, that uh, what can happen with dome collapses where we've lost some, some good colleagues and Pinatuba that happened around the same time. 
the CDO was established officially in 1982 and the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, I believe in 1986. Right, so now we're going to look at two volcanoes seemingly worlds apart, certainly hemispheres apart, Mount Rainier and Nevada de Ruiz. And think about what we were doing in 1985. Well, here in the Pacific Northwest, we were still, as geologists, pretty much enthralled with what was happening at Mount St. Helens. And we had a lot of new studies happening at other Cascade Range volcanoes. Uh, in the news at that time, really big news was that Calvin and Hobbes comic strip was going to be syndicated in 35 newspapers across the nation. That was November, 1985. Uh, the same month, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev, two, two presidents got together for the first time and also the first version of Windows 1.0 came out, uh, was put out by Microsoft. So that's what we were thinking about in the Pacific Northwest. That was what was in the news at that time. And unfortunately, not a lot of coverage went to what was happening at a seemingly obscure volcano in South America, in Colombia, uh, in uh, the Western Andes um, at Nevada de Ruiz. So, but that is the site of a very major, you know, significant event that in many ways changed um, the course of, of, uh, of history or changed the course of our approaches to volcanology. And it brought to our attention that these lahars that had happened in the past um, could happen again. And it wasn't just, they weren't just figments of some previous error. There are many similarities between these two volcanoes. You know, we have Mount Rainier, we have you know, major connecting rivers, uh, that five connecting rivers uh, that bring water from Mount Rainier down to the lowlands. And many of these areas are, these lowland areas are now densely populated. We have, uh, here you see a picture of the Rio Chinchina in Colombia, and it is a, uh, one, of the, one of the major rivers, one of five major rivers there as well. Uh, both of these volcanoes are much loved by local populations. And you can see Paradise at Rainier and El Refugio uh, on the slopes of Nevada de Ruiz before uh, it was destroyed. Both volcanoes have an extensive history of mudflows, so volcanic, volcanic uh, mudflows, lahars. And these lahars, these mudflows, if you have, have no previous experience, I should I, which may be the case for some of you, recognize that they are muddy slurries of water, boulders, small rocks, sand, gravel, uh, tree stumps, whatever gets in the way, that they, they flow down valley, they're gravity driven and they flow down valley, uh, perhaps at a you know, speed of uh, you know, 20, 30 miles per hour. And they speed across the valley floor and inundate in many cases having enough impact forces to knock down any kind of construction uh, that gets in their path. So we have had these at, at Mount Rainier and, and at Nevada de Ruiz. So uh, some of the big ones, there, there are more here that could be talked about. Patrick Pringle and I were talking about this this afternoon about you know, how, how we still don't have a complete record of everything that happened. And there's some even more tantalizing layers that need to be explored further. But some of the big ones we talk about are the Osceola uh, event, which was on the east side, which flowed down the White River to the west, uh, caused by an eruption, uh, destabilizing hydrothermally altered unstable rock. The National Lahar, 20, roughly 2,400 years ago, the White River events, probably a thousand years ago or so, uh, the Electron which uh, I, Patrick is noting is at, at the year uh, 1507. And so at Nevada de Ruiz, we also have these stories. We have reports of major lahars that flooded over areas in 1595. They were reported by the local, at the local mission. Uh, 1845, again, major fatalities. And in fact, in 1845, they commented that it's amazing that people even know that an event happened here and stripped the landscape in 1595 and people still rebuilt there. And then uh, the city of Armero was one of the, the principal places at risk. Uh, it's her, this, you're gonna see this picture, maybe you have already. This is the former city of Armero and uh, right at the base of the Rio, Rio Lagunillas 
uh, right here. So this is, you can see that the lahar flowed out of the mouth of the canyon and over the landscape to various effects. Okay, both volcanoes have significant snow and ice covers. And in 1985, we know we had about one cubic mile of snow and ice, as much as on all the other Cascade volcanoes combined. We did a study to determine that. It was a lot less at Nevada de Ruiz, but you know, one, of the store, one of the outcomes of, of uh, looking at results at Nevada de Ruiz is that you don't really need to have a big eruption to have a lot of snow melt water uh, uh, be formed and thus the, the um, creation of lahars. We even have stories from the indigenous people about some interesting events and we can't say for sure if this was the, uh, if the first one is referring to the electron mud flow, it might refer to it. Uh, to, it's, uh, the story says a Tacobid, one of the native names for the Mount Rainier, it had, it, its head broke open and the lake on top spilled out and the water rushed down and it filled the place where Ording now is and left the, the prairie covered with bubble filled stones. And then of course, I already mentioned the historical accounts in Colombia as well. All right, so we uh, had some big breakthroughs in understanding the Lahars. In fact, we really didn't have a, a, a appreciation of them at Mount Rainier until the 1950s when U.S. geologist Rocky Crandall and colleagues were mapping the Lake Taps Quadrangle and similar ones around the area. They found these really interesting deposits that they were sure were glacial deposits. In fact, others had you know, preliminary called them that. But there were a lot of mysteries about them because the rocks were of the wrong provenance. They didn't come from where they were expected. And they laid across the valley in a way that you wouldn't think uh, glacial deposits would do. You think you would have them smearing along the valley walls and you would have moraines form. But in this case, they it looked like they had flowed into place. And that really puzzled Rocky Crandall for a long time. But um, fortunately, he kept a pretty good field notebook. And on July 25th, 1953, he wrote his notes. He, very, uh, he just laid out the story about why he thought that this Osceola was not a, a glacial derived landscape, but that maybe it was something like um, a rocky, like the Coutts Creek mud flow, rock, mud rock flow, as he called it. Maybe you can see my cursor there. And so he went on to list about 11 implications. You know, if this is the case, then this is what I should look for. And he became pretty convinced that this was a, uh, a mud flow of some sort. And of course, there had been a mud flow just a few years earlier at Coutts Creek, at, which had enveloped a valley landscape. So that's what he had on his mind. And so uh, things proceeded pretty quickly after that. In 1956, he. Uh, uh, Crandall and Waldron wrote up a, an article about it in, uh, in uh, one of the journals. 1967, he wrote a hazard assessment followed in 1973 by a hazard map. 1971, he did a, this paper about the deposits. But, you know, these prof USGS professional papers are, are pretty canned. And at least in the past, you, you haven't been allowed to do a whole lot of talking beyond the results of your study, but I think that he really broke new ground by making recommendations in the last pages of that professional paper where he said, and I recommend that responsible authorities establish procedures to be followed if Mount Rainier should again become active. These procedures should include the following. He said we needed a Lahar detection and uh, system, system of warning for local people, evacuation plans, a plan for lowering the dam of Alder Reservoir, and plans for restricting uh, access uh, to these areas. And so, wow, that was, that was great. And he, um, not only did he write about it, but he went up and talked to park authorities and told them what, that all of their cultural features within the park were within Lahar hazard zones. I don't know if they were thrilled to hear that, but they did take some some uh, action. In fact, for many years, they, they closed the Longmire campground for that reason. Um, now it's open again for volunteers. Okay, so we're just going to talk about uh, Mount St. Helens really briefly and just note that that was an opportunity for people to 
get a uh, you know a hit of motivation, and we'll launch in back to these other volcanoes. But uh, there's a, a a younger Steve Malone. Uh, we all learn so much, and I think a lot of the ways that we've learned things have been well documented. And how we talk about Mount St. Helens being a master teacher and such. But it wasn't very long before a uh, well, I'll just backtrack a moment and, and say that in 1979, it's very instructive because um, Crandall wrote a chapter in a book saying that we really needed to give more attention to the eruption chronologies that could uh, help us understand the likelihood of future eruptions. That was 79. In 1981, USGS put out a, a very nice plan. Uh, you know, it was a uh, it was led by uh, Roy Bailey in the volcano program. And uh, it said that we should work at other volcanoes. And so, you know, pretty soon after people had spent their time at Mount St. Helens, they began to spread out and work at other volcanoes. And actually that work continues even today. So I've just put some pictures in here of, of some of the people who spent major amounts of time working at Mount Rainier. And you know, on the left is Jim Valance, who's looking, who's done an, an extraordinarily detailed uh, uh, mapping of the lahar layers, excuse me, of, of uh, ash layers. And Kevin Scott and Pat Pringle, who were working in uh, various valleys, the Puyallup Valley for Patrick, Yellow from Carbon, and Kevin in the Nisqually. And all these people working together have been able to kind of synthesize the data and were able to link lahars with uh, eruptions that happened because of, of Jim's work. So a lot of synthesis has happened. Okay, so we know a lot about this. We know now we recognize that Mount Rainier's first erupted about a million years ago, but the mountain building of the cone building at about a half a million has tephra bearing eruptions, but is pervasively altered as well, uh, has extensive history of lahars. The last eruption about a thousand years ago there are some 19th century reports of steam blast, although I think that that is in large part discounted. Uh, we, you can go back to the EOS of 2001 uh, by Sisson, Valens, and Pringle to see that the Mount Rainier grew in, in stages. And that mapping has commenced. I think that the, the official USGS large scale map is still in progress. We call Mount Rainier an active volcano because of these Holocene eruptions, the active hydrothermal system, it's being seismically active, and it's located on, a, on the, the active subduction zone where uh, magma is still forming. So we say that uh, we should expect future eruptions from Mount Rainier and we'll have these pyroclastic density currents. They will physically erode the snow, cause a lot of snow melt, and that water, meltwater, will mix with lahars that will travel tens of miles downstream. Right, so that all happened. We think, wow, well, that's, that's interesting that we know this. What are we going to do about it? Um, well, actually, I think at least one person in the audience was there at a meeting in 1993. I, Patrick uh, Pringle was telling me that he was one of the ones who went to public officials in 1993, told them they had a problem with lahars, that lahars could move down their valley. The official said, you can't just tell us, you have to tell the public. So in May of 1993, a meeting was held with about 200 residents and they were told about this. Uh, but they said, you know, you can't just tell us that we have a problem and not doing anything about it. You have to help us uh, with some risk reduction here. I, I guess at one of those meetings, uh, uh, farmers came up to Patrick and said, you know, you were talking about there being buried trees here and you should come over to our farm because we have a bunch of trees that are buried and you should take a look at them. So I guess that happened later, later in the summer. Right, so in 19, we all united together in a, in a volcano hazard working group. And uh, our main purpose was to get to know one another, to create a, a cohesive group that could plan for the next eruption and plan our response so we wouldn't be shaking hands at the beginning of a disaster. Uh, you know, we had uh, a, a 1995 hazard assessment written uh, in at that with the Volcano Hazard Working Group, we began outreach uh, 
doing teacher workshops. Uh, the heart detection system was set up uh, in the years soon after, notification system with sirens and with automatic calls. 1998 response plan was, uh, uh, was done and then it was later updated. Uh, evacuation signs were set up, evacuation drills, ongoing workers continues with improved monitoring systems, improved notification systems, you know, on and on that just work continues today. So at Mount Rainier, we, we say we have two aspects of our outreach. We have the army, which is a boots on the ground, uh, which reaches the, the very targeted audiences. And we reach people who are in basically information disseminators so that we can tell them the situation with Mount Rainier and then they can help us with outreach. And they're the policy makers, uh, preparedness plan uh, people and planners, classroom teachers, the news media, park staff, try to get the same message, key messages there. And of course we work with the public as well. And I've basically been a part of the army, I guess, over the years. Then we have the Air Force, uh, which uh, works on general information for websites and social media. And I'll tell you if, you, if you have not looked up and become a member of USGS Volcanoes on social media, on Facebook, for example, uh, you, you're missing a, an amazing discourse of people in, with interest in volcanoes. So USGS Volcanoes is a great place to go. And the, uh, we're able to also make sure that we are able to, can, to easily disseminate our volcano alert notifications there too. You know, in 2005 at 2004 at Mount St. Helens, we nearly knocked our system out by there being so many hits on our website. So now we just put the notifications on Facebook and it can be received, they can be re, uh, retrieved from there. And my colleague, Liz Wesby, uh, is one of the principals in the Air Force CBO. And then here are just a few pictures of signs and you know, the, the uh, siren system. Um, the, one of the Lahar evacuation route maps. And of course, this is a simplified hazard map showing the areas where Lahars could travel down valley. And the yellow you see here is where they could be traveling. The red is just the tiny small debris flows that happen seasonally, Mount Rainier. And the purple indicates areas that can be impacted downstream because of the long-term sediment flux. You know, one of the longest legacies of a volcanic eruption at, in, on these ice clad volcanoes is sediment, sediment moving downstream. Okay, so one, okay, let's move to Nevada de Ruiz now. So it's one of the major volcanoes of Colombia. It taught us a lot about relationship building and being ready to work with public officials. It taught us really that you know a large amount of our time needs to go to this relationship building. Geology is not just about conducting geological analyses, and so let's look at the look look at its um, it's, it's a little bit of information about it right now. It's a very another very broad glacier covered volcanoes. Um, it's three major edifices. It's a it's a comp, composite cone. It has lava domes at the top, it has an 800 foot deep crater at the summit as well. Large parts of it are, are pervasively altered. And uh, there has been a lot of melting of, of the summit, summit ice cap during eruptions in the past. It went through uh, so four major eruptive phases. It's, uh, there have been a lot of deconstructive events, a lot of destruction by debris avalanches, land, big landslides, as well as constructive processes like lava flows and lava domes and pyroclastic flow density currents and such. And of course, there's a lot of glacial uh, deposits there that can be picked up and moved if there's water moving over the surface. There have been about 19 or more eruptive events identified there in the last 6,000 years or so. Right now we're gonna to move to a hazard map here and move towards 1985. And you should know the geography a little bit here. You can see uh, that this is a hazard map showing areas at risk from lahars and maybe from volcanic ash. Uh, there are two major communities that were impacted in 1985, which we're gonna, you're gonna hear about. So I'll just point them on the map. Here's uh, uh, Chinchina and Armero. This is Chinchina has small communities uh, Rio del Claro is one of the tiny communities most affected in this region. 
and uh, Armero is the is the area that had a large population of you know, roughly fifty thousand people or so. All right, let's look at what was going on in 1985. Uh, it was in December 1984 that there was observable increases. There were observable increases in crater steam. They noticed the color change on the crater rim, the sulfur deposits. There were earthquakes and tremors and loud noises that really frightened people. In February, geologic investigations began. Uh, but remember that uh, in 1985, the, there was no strong geological survey of Colombia. And so they had very few people who, were, who had the experience to work on a volcano going into a state of unrest. Uh, one of the people was uh, uh, Marta Calvache. I'm just going to go back here just momentarily to show you her picture here. This has basically shaped her this experience as a young geologist, seismologist, basically shaped her life and her entire career. Uh, she was one of the people who initiated discussions with authorities and the public. And then from September to November 1985, there was in on September 11th, there was a very strong ash eruption and that really got everybody's attention. But then as usually happens, eruption acti activity decreases and people forget that it may not all be over. In uh, October 22nd, 1985, a new hazard map was, release, was released. Um, it was thought to be too alarming. It went back to the shop. Uh, it was being redone, was to be introduced within a day or two, but nature took over. Okay. People continued to, there was continued discussion in the communities, but not everybody had the same voice. And some people said, you know, maybe you need to go to the church that will keep you safe. Uh, <laughs> rumors were rampant as to what should be done. There was panic and indifference. Sometimes one led to the other. It was a mess. And it was very frustrating for the scientists there. But, uh, you know, events continued. Um, let's look at, uh, let's see, I can't see that. All right, so 908. Oops. Okay, so I can't see the timing there. We had a steam eruption at 9.08 p.m there was a tephra fall, volcanic ash fall. And spending time there myself, I've talked to a lot of people who were survivors and they told me what it was like and how the ash was falling and that got their attention. And then when it ceased, everybody thought every, it was all over. They thought, oh, we were told that the, an eruption might happen, but now it's over, that's great. But at the same time, pyroclastic flows were ripping down the side of the volcano, the snow and ice, creating melt. At 10.30 in the evening, the Lahar reached Chinchana. 1,800 people were killed, 1,800 people. At 1045, you know, it's all a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's just sad to see. At 1030, that happened. At 1045, Armero was warned, but people didn't take it seriously. One reason they didn't take it seriously is because of what was going on in their lives right then. They had a football, a soccer uh, championship going on. And so everybody was up late, they were, riveted to their TV screens in their living rooms, wanting to watch these games. And, you know, and all the excitement of earlier in the evening with the ash fall, that was all over. So people were there in their living rooms. Worst nightmare, it was a dark and stormy night, literally. And on top of that, a lahar burst out of the canyon and covered our marrow. Much of the city was swept away and other parts received, they, it was like a fire hose moving over it. And in other areas that were very slightly higher, uh, the, the mud infiltrated down through the buildings but still destroyed them. About 21,000 people died 
uh, in our marrow, probably more, I mean, 23. I mean, the numbers are just, they range from 23 to 25,000 fatalities uh, across the board. So this was just absolutely deadly. This was the fourth, the fourth largest loss of life in recorded history at a volcano, you know, behind Tambora, which I think was like 71 at 250, um, you know, who knows, and uh, Krakatoa, I think it was 36,000, 30,000 lost at Mount Pele in Martinique in 2000, 1902, and here a good 23, 25,000 people lost. Wow. So here's uh, many years later, this is nearly 30 years later, this is Marte Calvache taking us on a geology field trip, showing us how the lahar came over and rounded these rocks as it went over the ledge and went down, down valley towards Armero. Oh, this was just a, this was very depressing. People were stunned um, with the loss of life and people who were aware of it, you know, globally, especially in the volcanological community took note. There was a lot of after action analysis, a lot of revisions that ensued. And I'll tell you about some of those. First, I'm gonna point out the little girl here, Amira Sanchez, who became the symbol of loss. And her, she became, she was right near the end of the Lahar. I mean, I've seen the place where they dug her out eventually. And it is within maybe 10, 15 feet of the edge of the Lahar. But all the beams, all the bodies came to rest there and she was stuck between the bodies of her family and uh, some of the beams and she couldn't get out. Her legs were caught. This man on the right, young man at the time, uh, part of the Talima response team, spent a lot of time with her over several days and uh, talked with her, tried to soothe her. Um, she was, uh, he talked about it later. He told us what that was like, and he hopes that he could give her some, some, some solace. But she did pass away after several days from hypothermia, and she's become somewhat of a symbol. So I've talked about a lack of communication, a lack of redundancy in communication, actually, that you know, allowed some people to get messages, but they weren't transferred elsewhere. Talked about how people didn't really believe what was going to happen. They didn't have a plan. And so, you know, Barry Voigt really said it best that it wasn't technological ineffectiveness or it wasn't an overwhelming character of the eruption or the improbable run of bad luck. It was purely and simply by cumulative human error over a considerable period of time by misjudgment and indecision and bureaucratic short sightedness that this disaster happened. It could be that there was no victims because they only had to move about half a mile to get the high ground and they would have been safe. All right, so the Colombians responded in a really admirable way that got the attention of the whole, the, the world's uh, volcanological community. They established three volcano observatories where none had existed before. They developed a multi-level, multi-governmental level disaster preparedness and response group. They trained volcanologists in their universities. They set up. 885 monitoring stations and warning systems at 23 active volcanoes, uh, done hazard assessments for 10 of them, standardized their alert level system. And wow, are they big on community education programs. They call it social appro appropriation of knowledge. So the social appropriation of knowledge is, is just, a, a, just something to behold. They, uh, these are people who have been through a disaster, who are very clear-eyed about what needs to be done. They're not looking for, um, they're not looking for any kind of guessing about what they have to do. They know they have to go to the indigenous communities, to the schools, to the local influencers and the champions and communities. They have to talk to those people and get them engaged. They have to have, have these targeted audience they must reach. So I mean, what they've done basically is is very similar to what is recommended around the world, a community-based disaster risk reduction, where you have the whole community being involved. And then FEMA calls it the whole community approach as well. 
So they started with guiding uh, people through open houses and they visited schools and they had uh, BNL student gatherings that I'll tell you more about later. And uh, here you can see uh, you know, one of the scientists at Manizales Volcano Observatory with a, uh, the NASA Kiwi uh, indigenous group leader you know, talking about Lahars. And uh, for some people who might know her, this is a, a Mount St. Helens Institute uh, staff member, uh, Sonia Melander, teaching a group, you know, how to do volcano yoga. And they were a little stiff sitting there for a number of hours in a meeting, but she really loosened everybody up. <laughs> well, all this really paid off, actually. It was amazing because uh, events in other parts of the country uh, happened, really served as a a very positive bookend to a, a, a bad era. You know, we lost maybe 25,000 people through Nevada de Ruiz. But in 1994, there was a landslide that happened at, at near Nevada de Huela. There was a lot of very old altered rock there, unstable. And then when a magnitude you know, six some earthquake hit it, the whole thing split away and made a massive landslide, you know, Lahar that moved down valley. 20,000 people, excuse me, there were 1,100 people who died in that, e that landslide event. Uh, 20,000 people lost their homes. So the, you can see the area that was affected. You can see the river on the left, the Rio Magdalena. And uh, then they thought, well, you know what? Social appropriation of knowledge, let's train people so that we, so they don't have to go through this again. And we can see that, the, the, there's been a lot of aggradation in the riverbed. Uh, let's try to get people out of the way and then, you know, teach them about evacuation and let's involve the local people. So they did that. 2007, after Nevada del Huila had reawakened, another lahar ensued. And this time they evacuated many, many thousands of people and only 10 people lost their lives. Same thing happened in 2008. And see more aggradation, all this debris being in place. This time, only four people lost their lives. And I have to give a lot of credit to the, the teachers and the, um, a lot of people in the, 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 the uh, Cruz Roja, the, the, the Red Cross of Colombia. They all worked together to practice evacuations and to be ready for the next one. This right here is a school. There you can see it before 2008, and here it is destroyed. So that's a, I would say that's a great bookend um, of success from, you know, on the, uh, the opposite side being loss of life in the, the, the modern always. So, you know, working in, in the United States, we came to realize that there are a lot of, lot, of, lot of opportunities for scientists to travel. They can go on international trips, um, you know, go to volcanoes, at least in the Volcano Hazards Program. But they're really, a lot of the load of dealing with volcanic response is on the shoulders of the non-scientists, you know, those non-scientific stakeholders are really critical. You know, the emergency managers and the planners and the responders and community educators. And so my colleague in, in the, the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program said, you know, let's put together, I think I can get money for a bi-national exchange. Let's try this and see if it works and see if we can get find some officials in, in Washington state near Mount Rainier who want to go down to Columbia. Understand not everybody wants to do that. So, uh, so uh, he kind of put me on to the task and it was uh, very cathartic to do that. And uh, yeah, we did find, uh, I think there were 10 of us who went to Columbia. It was, uh, it was in 2013, it was the first of 11 binational exchanges that we've done, uh, two-way exchanges. So I've taken people down there on six occasions, mostly from the Mount Rainier area. It really provided that, you know, as, as best of a firsthand account, a disaster experience, you could, you could hear the disaster in the voices of the survivors. Uh, and so uh, it, we learned a lot about, you know, that were a lot, it was very practical. We became, people became familiar with the hazards and we could explore mitigation measures together. So some people you might know, you might know Peggy Lovellford with, with Pierce County Emergency Management and Scott Beeson with Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, this here's Karina Allen, uh, who is exchanging gifts with the two gentlemen 
from who were the first people to arrive at our marrow in 1985. And the man that I showed you who was laying on the ground, holding the hand of Omira Sanchez was this gentleman right here. So these binational exchanges were great. It was really fun to have these um, non-scientist stakeholders become familiar with, you know, spend time with geologists. They learn about Lahars. We had, <laughs> uh, uh, we had a quite amazing cultural experience, understanding the Colombians and they, us. Now here we are at the Rio Azafrado, looking into the heart of the valley where one of the, one of the Lahars uh, descended off of Nevada Ruiz in 1985. There's Celia Taylor, who's now with King County Emergency Management. Karina Allen again at Washington Geological Survey. So we've had roughly 50 people travel on these so far. Uh, we've had a, a great opportunity to visit with the, at all levels of hazard mitigation uh, in the nation from the national level to the department, the state level, and at the very local level. There's Brian Turbush of, of uh, Washington Emergency Management Division. I see Pat Donovan there from the city of Puyallup, Celia Taylor again, uh, King County. And so we visited the volcano observatories. There's Marta talking, showing Rob Allen of Puyallup, no, excuse me, of Pierce County Land Use uh, Planning Division. Uh, he's work, working with Marta looking at the, the 1985 seismograms. You know, we toured the, their mitigation facilities. And here you can see, uh, there they are on the table there. We looked at some facilities that are used as a Lahari evacuate. They kind of double as Lahari evacuation route facilities. We looked at their, their Lahar siren system. Uh, here's Marta Calvace once again, who has become somewhat of a, a, a principal person for teaching in the country, as well as doing her geology work. We were in uh, uh, Rio del Claro, and she asked these two little boys who are just out there playing with sticks and kind of following us around. We're pretty, uh, I guess we were, hadn't seen the likes of us before. And she said, hey, boys, what do you know about that siren up there on the wall? What do you know about it? What can you tell me? And the two answered, well, we know that we're never supposed to play with it, never supposed to touch it. And we know that when it goes off, when it rings, we're supposed to run up the hill behind the banana, through the banana orchard. So we were pretty impressed that those little kids knew what to do. Here we are taking a look at geologic maps. Yeah, you know, everybody has to do this on geologic field trips, right? Uh, we looked at their monitoring systems uh, high up on the slopes. And then we visited many deposits, uh, many, so lots of devastated areas. Here, this is the former city square of downtown Armero. You know, where you know, roughly 50,000 people once lived. There are many private memorials in this area. Uh, this is the old hospital. This is where the, you can see the front entrance gate here. To me, this is one of the really touching places in the city because I heard stories from the rescuers about what it was like to go to the, uh, the newborn area. And um, they knew that there were a lot of women who had just given birth there and they had babies and yet the floor was covering, getting covered with mud. And they were on the roof trying to rescue these people. And when they were looking in the windows, they could see the mothers holding their babies up above their heads to keep them out of the mud. There were many damaged structures. I noted a lot of places, the buildings were intact, but they're not habitable anymore. This gentleman told us about the loss of his, his, most of his family. And there's a picture of his mom. Uh, another person, and this actually has a very interesting, this slide is a very in interesting point about it. Um, this is the mayor of the city of Armero for the time that we were there in 2013. And he uh, is a is a, is a, was a childhood survivor. And he told us about how they were in their living room. They were watching TV, they were watching the soccer championships. He and his little brother, three years old, and his mom. And they heard this roaring outside and they didn't know what it was. So they opened the front door and this muddy Lahar deposit poured in. And he and his mom and, uh, and little brother 
all held hands and tried to get up on top of a wall outside. But of course, the little, little boy, the little brother lost his grip and was lost in the lahar. Um, he's still convinced that his brother cannot be dead. He must be somewhere and maybe somebody adopted him in another country. Now, this man is in a position of authority. And so he can set policy uh, and about uh, lahar safety. I should bring out, I should point out that the city of Armero, you have the survivors spread out all over, uh, but many of them moved just a few miles away to a place called Guayabil or New Armero. So he, is a, he was the mayor at New Armero during this, this visit. And he told me, you know, we went to the local library, uh, the school library, and we talked for a couple of hours about what could be done. He said the very basic thing was giving geography lessons in schools. And he said at that time, they had no idea that the Varadar waste, which they could not even see from their community, was connected to it in some way, in some hazardous way. So that would be a place to start. And he kind of pleaded that uh, we help him somehow. And so, of course, we did. We've been back working with them on, on, on volcano curriculum, um, which has been accomplished. The next time I saw him was in 2016. And by that time, he had started a huge museum. You'll see later, Interpretive Center, put the money aside for it. And he also had a little three-year-old in tow, his own son, which was nice to see. This gentleman was in charge of the response from the Tolima district, or state as we would call it here. And he's had, he minced no words telling us that there was no place for a lack of coordination and for risk reduction measures pre-crisis. Right then the Colombians came here and here we are at, uh, Johnson Ridge Observatory, maybe many of you have been there. Here's Marta Calvace and Gloria Patricia. You might uh, recognize John Ewart here, the instigator of the binational exchanges and Andy Lockhart, and myself. So they asked to be taken to the same kinds of places that, uh, same kinds of groups that they partner with in Colombia. And by the way, the group is much larger than them. They were just the ones in the picture. So here they are at evacuation drill in Ording. Marta did multiple public presentations and she said repeatedly, learn from, basically learn from us is what she wanted so that we, that you do not suffer the same tragedies. And so we also, over the course of time, took them to some, uh, this is like a, a, over multiple years, it's between um, 2013 and early 2020, uh, when we had to stop doing the exchanges, at least for now. Uh, but they asked to go to places of memorial memorialization. They wanted to learn how other people memorialize. And it became very clear talking to people like at the Bainbridge Island Japanese uh, American Exclusion Memorial at Mount St. Helens that you need to tell individual stories. That's what makes it real. Uh, we had uh, teachers and educators from Columbia come and join our Mount Rainier teacher workshops. That was quite a hoot. And that's colleague Liz, Liz Westby uh, at Mount Rainier. And then the Colombians started this Biennale, this, this, this group. Well, it's actually an event that happens every other year where they bring together as many students as they can from volcanic areas around the nation. And they do uh, plays and skits and report on things. And uh, so we've been to three of those. We've taken people to three of these Biennales so far. So there's a lot of progress. Uh, a lot of progress for us. We have you know, volcano evacuation drills you know, happening in the city of Ording, the city of Puyallup. We've, uh, there are, you know, there's just a lot going on. <laughs> there's, uh, there's signage that's up in terms of evacuation routes and interpretive signage. Um, there are emergency preparedness fairs where lahars are figured big time. In 2019, there it was just really fun to Look around the room in the control center at the in the for the city of Puyallup and see you know six eight people who had been involved in binational exchanges um, in charge and we had eight thousand students uh, do an evacuation drill. So uh, now we have a, a twenty nine two law that says that all schools in volcano evacuation areas excuse me volcano risk areas must go through a drill. 
And so a big one is planned, a multi-district one is planned for April, 2022 in uh, east of Puyallup. Um, and uh, we've also, this is, this is not just the USGS, you know, we work together in the Volcano Hazard Work Group, it's this multi-agency. multi, multi uh, agency. And you know, there are nice items here from uh, the uh, Washington Geological Survey and very nice website they've assembled. Uh, EMD, Emergency Management Division, was a lead on this interpretive sign. We have a series of those. There are websites, multiple websites, um, and there's a fair. Okay, in Columbia, they, they, it just accelerated their progress. There's a lot of increased coordination. And, and Marta said, just are getting together with the people from the Tolima State, State or Department of Tolima, getting together with, you know, for example, their Mani Salas uh, fire officer, you know, and scientists. And here's someone from the national level, just everybody getting together uh, really helped their coordination a lot. Uh, so I've mentioned that they have, uh, you know, educational programs uh, and a new museum. This big museum uh, in New Armero is quite a sight to behold. It, it has a, uh, it's become somewhat of a recreational center. They have a, a, a swimming pool there. They have um, museum exhibits, conference room where people can meet. They have lots of cultural events going on there. There's also the Parque Natural. National Natural uh, Los Navarros, the big international geopark. I'm not sure that it's official at this point, but they're trying to make it official. And there's a visitor orientation center where you can get guide services to take you through the Armero ruins. Okay, so what all did we learn? A lot, you know, scientists learned that even small eruptions can cause a large loss of life. I mean, lahars that traveled long distances down valley cause loss of life. That we must work as educators. It, uh, as well as using our geological skills. And maybe we need to use the same creativity and, and you know, force of effort in our communications as we do with our geologic endeavors. Um, policymakers, they really need to be prepared with their plans. They need to be practiced repeatedly. There has to be redundancy in communications. There has to be a lot of trust and partnerships built among themselves and local populations. And for the at-risk populations, we need to have an effective detection and, and warning system. People need to know what to do. They need to practice regularly. And the population must know that the local officials, uh, they, 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 must know that, they must know them. If they don't, uh, they're probably they're less likely to listen to national level figures than people locally. So what have we learned from just overall that might help us with risk reduction uh, at, in other areas, you know, whether it be tsunamis or earthquakes um, or whatever, you know, windstorms, snowstorms. Uh, we, it's just a, we have a, tar, we have this, the group we're trying to work with is just a, a constantly moving target. And I know uh, after doing lots of work in, in the city of Ording, and people would come up to me and say, you know, I know, but I talk to people, they don't know anything about this. And I realized, well, it's a moving target. New people move in, others move out. Uh, people come in and wonder what, if Mount Rainier truly is a volcano. Um, some people are, are learn and then they forget. So there, and then there's a you know, older generation and younger generations, older generation, they remember Mount St. Helens and others do not. So we just always have to remember that this is a never ending task. And I've told you some of our risk reduction measures today, but, and I'm, I'm happy, I'm proud that a lot of those things have taken force, taken effect, but we are by in no sense done. And it's just gonna go on and on. It needs to go on and on. Some people would call this a Sisyphean task, but I'd like to think that there's a, be a little more positive and say that it's, it's not fruitless. We need to work together and kind of institutionalize the message so that all groups are pulling together. We need to tell stories about what's happened in the past and make them very personal and have a face to the disaster like Omaira Sanchez. Experiential learning, you know, uh, uh, Kolb, uh, educator Kolb back in the 1970s and 80s talked about how you must experience something and then reflect on it and then you take make a plan and then you take action. That's very important. And, uh, even secondhand exposure to survivors can be very motivating. You need to make it fun. 
and educational and positive, and you still have to honor what's happened in the past, but look forward and share resources, hold one another accountable and prepare for a long-term, long-term work because this work is never done. Okay, that's all I have Oops. in terms of slides. So I know it's a little, in what, 50 some minutes. So uh, thank you for listening. And uh, I guess I'd like to see some, some questions as well as some comments in the, in the, in the chat section there. Uh, you know, have you vis visited a volcano? And if so, what did you learn? Have you been involved in risk reduction measures in your community? What did you do? I mean, and what's motivating to you? So. Carol? Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful presentation. We'll engage in the questions now, but I'm going to give you a little virtual clap there. How's that? Thanks very much. Got How's it. So uh, Rebecca has been compiling some questions and we'll just uh, feed them up to you here. Uh, Here's one. In the recent Indonesian eruption, it was reported that intense precipitation played a role. Is there a tie between increased precipitation due to climate change and increased volcanic activity or risk? So climate volcano risk associations. Okay, well, uh, I am not familiar with studies that link those two, but I have to say that every time we have something some unusual precipitation event that reaches areas that has have been previously stable um, and no longer are, then we you know we have a chance of additional uh, perhaps landslides, at least a quick runoff downstream. And if we have less snowpack, we may have more areas exposed. So it's quite possible that if you know, I don't think we can relate it directly here without a study being long-term study being done, but it's quite possible that these changes in precipitation patterns will cause runoff where it hasn't happened before, possibly Lahars. Okay. Here's one from somebody labeled Quimper. I don't know who that is, but anyway, they said, is the Bridge for Kids project, I'm not familiar with that, still, still a possible evacuation tool or is that pedestrian bridge concept run into too many roadblocks? Okay, the, so thanks for noting that. So the Bridge for Kids was an effort that was put forth. It was first begun in the 1990s, uh, mid 1990s, where people realized that in the city of Ording realized that their community exists between two rivers, between the Carbon and the Puyallup River, and they can't get to high ground without crossing a river. So what are they to do? And uh, their school, their sc whole, most of the schools are close to the Carbon River closest to the Carbon River where they can get the high ground. And there might be an old trail that could get people you know, up to high ground pretty easily, but there's no way across the river. So maybe a bridge should be built and maybe they need a bridge across the highway as well to get to the region uh, close to the bridge. So uh, a lot of good effort was put in there by, by uh, local people. And they, uh, to make a long story short, I think it came to the point where they realized a bridge it was just going to be too expensive. And so they couldn't follow through with it. But it looks like the money has come forth for a bridge across the highway, if not across the river. Uh, the other thing is that there is a good possibility that additional roads will be built across the, with bridges across the river in that general area. And hopefully that will alleviate the problem of people getting to the river edge and not having a way across. So that's an ongoing issue. And there are many ongoing issues with how evacuation is going to happen in the valley because of the they're being hemmed in by rivers on both sides. Roberta Harma asks, is there a particular part of Mount Rainier or its outflow area that holds greatest risk? Can you say uh, that? Is there a part of Rainier or its outflow area that poses the greatest risk? That is part of the irony of it all. Multiple rivers on Mount Rainier, the, the White, the Nisqually, the Cowlitz have systems of dams on their lower sections where presumably some of the sediment from a lahar can be contained. Uh, they, although they probably need to lower the water level within the, uh, within the reservoir before there'd be space for it. Uh, that's not the case with the Puyallup and the Carbon, but the Puyallup River that it comes off of the, the west side 
um, there is no dam. And additionally, that section of the mountain is, was subject to much hydrothermal alteration. In other words, the, the, the rocks were, the, the feldspars, they were, they were uh, soaked long-term, you know, just some during the dike emplacement, they were, there was heated rock and heated groundwater and, you know, sulfur gases rising, uh, meeting with the groundwater created this weakly acidic solution that would bathe the rocks, make them very weak and unstable. We call that orangey material, it's very spongy, uh, a, a uh, hydrothermally altered rock. So basically the rock turns to, solid rock turns to clay. Um, and we have the largest portion of that on the west side of Mount Rainier and some at the summit as well. So, yeah, uh, so ironically, the, you know, that section that, uh, or I should say, unfortunately, perhaps, that, that section that has much hydrothermally altered rock is most subject to failure um, is also in a valley. It doesn't have it, uh, any dam above it. I want to say, too, that most of the lahars that happen, like 99% of them, perhaps, that happen at Mount Rainier in the past, have occurred during an eruption. And, but we can have lahars happen in two ways there. One from the melting of snow and ice and during an eruption for which we will have some warning because of precursory signals that we now can identify. And the second way is by just failure of the slope, just you know, massive rock fall, uh, which can pick up lots of water and be transformed into a lahar and move down valley. And that is what happened 500 years ago, uh, roughly 500 years ago, 1507, with the, um, you know, with the electron mud flow. Okay, I'll stop, stop there. Questions are coming in. Uh, someone must live in Renton. They say, how long might it take for the debris to flow to reach my area in Renton? Is this a half an hour, a two hour event? Hey, so, so what area are they, are they referring to? It's Renton in general. Oh, Renton, okay. So uh, Renton is a, a place that has seen a lot of lahars in the past. So lahar deposits are there and they're probably living on lahar deposits. They're living, actually living on, on uh, you know, embayment that has filled, was filled in in part by lahar sediments. Um, it could be that future lahar uh, sediments will flow into that area in the future, but probably as part of the kind of a post lahar sedimentation. We don't expect a lahar that would travel that far. Lahar traveling to the city of Ording would take roughly 50, 50 60 minutes uh, to Sumner, a little bit longer than that. And, uh, but pretty much pile up there and, and you know, maybe flow and flow out towards the west. Uh, there can be lahars coming down the White River as well. Now we have the Mud Mountain Dam on the White River, which can trap sediments. That might work for quite a while, hopefully for a long time. And so we don't expect a lahar to come roaring through Renton, but they could expect the rivers, you know, to have lots of sediment within them, the sediment be carried down, uh, a lot of displacement of water and a lot of, therefore a lot of flooding in the Renton area. For many years, this is a long-term proposition. Okay, here's one more I think we'll take. Uh, what a great talk this has been. Curious if you, you or anyone else have seen the recent Hollywood film, Don't Look Up, which has to do with climate change. It's on Netflix now, a nice advertisement. And if you could speak of the media's role in communication of hazards and threats identified by scientific research. Okay, no, I haven't seen it, but I intend that, that movie, but I intend to. And secondly, I think we've all know the importance of an educated media. We know that, that media you know, it's a very broad term. News media is a very broad term. There are people across the spectrum that we have met over time. <laughs> people who want completely unrealistic accounts from us um, and others who truly just want to learn. And we try to, you know, we're never going to meet everybody's needs. So we try to work with the people who are sincere about presenting an accurate story. And we, we've told them that we consider them part of our volcano communication plan, try to you know, let them know the importance of their role in giving accurate information. Uh, we've had them at trainings. We've trained them uh, on multiple occasions. Uh, you can never train. There's never enough training that can be done You're, because that's a, a, one of those constantly evolving professions as well. So, but the, the point is they are one of our targeted audiences to, 
for which we want to build relationships and give them information that will, will help them and therefore they can help us. Here's a, here's a question for myself, but others are asking the same sorts of things. You mentioned 150,000 people uh, might lie in the uh, outflow risk area from Rainier eruptions. Um, but it sounds like life, lives can be saved by preparedness, but what about the infrastructure? We just saw in Superior and, and Marshall and uh, the other town, Louisville, that they lost only, I think, three lives, but they, I think, probably suffered a trillion dollars in, uh, in infrastructure losses, houses, highways, and everything else. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, I should point out also that the 150,000 are people who live on old Lahar deposits, but that, you know, that includes a lot of people who are still at risk today as well. I don't think people have any conception as to what it's going to be like when we have a lahar come you know in one of these valleys along any of the any of these volcanoes. And, you know for me I've been talking about this for years and it wasn't until a 2001 exercise where we took you know 90 people back to West Virginia to a FEMA facility and we practiced an, our response to an eruption for 4 days. And I realized that you know nobody's going home. It's not like snow that you can remove easily. And uh, there will be a lot of disruption and people will need to move to new locations. The area will be unstable for generations. You cannot rebuild on a Lahar hazard zone and you, you cannot dike yourself uh, away from the water. So uh, I don't like to end on such a sobering note, but I think it's uh, really important to recognize that a Lahar is a, you know, an event that, that changes the landscape forever and as it has already done in Puget Sound. Well, thanks. I, I'm, I think we should wrap it up. It's getting to be 520 or so. It's a wonderful presentation. I think uh, people in Port Townsend can be assured they're a little safer than Tacoma and Seattle, but there's no solace to that. So uh, thanks for doing this Zoom presentation. Wish we could have had you down to Port up to Port Townsend, but that's for another year, I think. So without further ado, thank you, Carolyn, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thank you.